you, you, you say this was, this, this is your, your retirement life or your, your post corporate life. Did you have that same philosophy or outlook or dailiness about your professional life? Did you, I mean, that's a, that's a different mindset. When you get up and every day you choose, you can choose to do those things. You've been, you're very, you're not, just, you're not fortunate. You're, you're, a, you're an achiever. You've, you've accomplished a lot and you're giving back. Congratulations. But to achieve, you had to work and get in that dailiness that grinds people down that they can't look up and see that light that you have become and are shining out. Even the, even in the, the, the board behind you there, the screen behind you, the Northern lights, you know, you're, you're becoming a light. Did, did, was there a moment in your life, like the Dewey decimal, day when you were like, oh, this is a, this is a moment for me? You hit like Paul, you know, Saul on the road to Tarsus. Did you hit your knees and say, this is what I have to do with my life? Uh, when I knew what I had to do in school, I wasn't sure what I was going to do in life. So once I started reading those achievement narratives and I developed this confidence in myself that I could succeed at Virginia Tech, that definitely spilled over into of the next sets of experiences. So for example, after I finished at Tech, I, the summer I spent at the Kennedy School at Harvard, and I was coming, I literally packed my car in Blacksburg, Virginia to drive um, to Cambridge. And I was a little nervous. I had never been to Harvard before. Nobody in my family had been there. I was expecting to see these kids with these big heads and thick glasses, you know, spouting the theory of relativity at a moment's notice. And I got there and it was just regular people. I mean, they were smart, but so were people at Virginia Tech. And so then I realized, oh my God, I've been fooling myself. I can exist here. I can do this work too. And so, you know, confidence is an amazing thing. And if you have confidence, um, you take on some challenges big and small. And so for me then, when I got into the corporate world, I brought that confidence with me. When you're in a big company like Verizon where the data is what drives decisions as opposed to personalities or titles, um, then you, you hone in on, on the data to, to, to create solutions for customers. And so there, I wasn't thinking as much about how I might use my gifts, my talents, my interests to change the world. So I think that's the pivot. So now post-retirement where the basic necessities are cared for, I found my soulmate, so I'm happy. Um, so now I'm at a place where, you know, what's my contribution back to civil society? And I think it was after I, I, I finished the work at Verizon, um, that I realized that I wasn't done yet. And so I think, um, I, I, like I said, I studied a bit before choosing to create a, a media company because I wanted to make sure that what I did had impact and was lasting. Well, it sounds like you're recreating or retelling or telling the, the achievement narratives. I mean, that's the, 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 that, that which drove you to your best self you're telling to a broader, deeper audience and, and, and on a level that they can absorb. Absolutely. Is that, absolutely. Is that what I'm hearing? Is that, is that fair? That, 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 that's, that's absolutely fair. And then some people ask me, is it, is it just aimed at black people or minorities? And I say, it's aimed at everybody. Because right. in the same way that I was robbed as a high school student, an elementary student of that narrative, um, people that are not from my community or work from my community or who are not black or anybody, white people, Asian people, Native American people. Right. They were not privy to those accomplishments either. So we all grew up in this soup of, of a particular kind of education that spoke about the contributions of white people in particular. And it really underplayed the contributions of women and minorities. And so you can begin to see how people might believe that one group has certain talents and one group has another talent when the truth is, you know, talent is randomly distributed throughout our species and anyone among us uh, may have the cure for ALS or the cure for cancer or the cure for Alzheimer's. And so if we're smart, you invest in everybody 
you don't just try to pick winners or losers. Right. If, you, if, you, if you invest in everybody in our country and make sure that every young lady and every young man has what they need to be the best version of themselves, guess what? We all win. Oh, yeah. We all win. <laughs> a lot easier when people are productive and trying to produce something that's based on their own natural abilities and talents, and it's accelerated. I remember, to your point about the achievement narrative, my grandmother on my, mater my mo maternal grandmother, uh, big baseball fan, and she lived in Pittsburgh. With, that's where my family is on both sides of the aisle. She was a huge Roberto Clemente fan. And I, and I was born in 65 and Clemente died in 72. So it wasn't like I experienced a lot of Roberto Clemente film in my days. And clearly he wasn't on in Detroit where I, where I grew up at the time. But she would always say to me, that's a great man. Mm. And it always moved me that I would say, yeah, he's a great ball player. And she'd say, no, he's an even better person. And so because she set the frame of this is what success looks like for being a good person, I, he was sort of, he was my childhood hero growing up because my grandmother set it in place. Yeah. The narrative she described for me because I adored her, I was like, well, I'm going to try to be like Roberto Clemente yeah. and tell me more about him. So and it's so important, especially for children to have that, that person or that you know, that lodestar, that, you know, that something to shoot for that sets the, this is, this is accepted, one, it is good, and it will be, you know, supported um, to, to move forward successfully and happily in life. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm on the board of a, a group called Media Mentors, and a number of people from around the state, and we're trying to kind of cultivate the next generation of young media creators. So we help them to create documentaries, and to tell their own stories. One of the advisors is a famous artist, and he, we had our, our first board meeting, um, and he was sharing what motivated him to get involved with media. Um, most people can appreciate that media is one of the most powerful tools ever created. You know, it's in your house, we check it out on at the cinema when, when they're open, we have it on our phones, it's very powerful and it shapes points of view. And so he was going, representing a, a, the state in a foreign country, and he was a, a delegate, literally. And so, the, so he, he noticed that the host would look at him odd from time to time at the early parts of dinner. And at some point, uh, she came to him and she said, you know, I've listened to you tonight and I owe you an apology. And he was like, you owe me an apology, what, what for? She was like, because I was afraid to have you in my house and afraid to have you around my children because of what I saw about people that look like you on TV and in movies. Wow. She didn't know this man from Adam. Wow. And so, but the image she framed of everybody that looked like him came from TV and movies. And so he said that from that day to this, he has made sure that he is involved in things to make sure that we inform the narrative. Because what happens when people who don't know your experience or don't know your community tell your story, by design, they tell it from their point of view. And if we've all been poisoned by a biased education or an incomplete narrative, then it's just hard for people to see something different. I mean, you know I've, how many conversations I've been in where, you know, I was president of the phone company and people would, well, 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 so what did you do at the phone company? I was president of the phone company. So what did you do? Oh, I did what the president does. <laughs> I mean, because they can't get it in their head. So like, who'd you work for? Well, I mean, we have a board of directors and that sort of thing, but I was kind of the head guy. And it's just really hard because their, their, their education, their worldview, doesn't tell them that guys that look like me do those sorts of things. And if you keep a certain line of thinking going long enough, people begin to believe it and they pass it on. Thank goodness for your um, mom and your family who told you Roberto Clemente was a good man. So you started off, or at least you had counter information to whatever you might've been getting otherwise that said, hey, this is a good guy, he's okay to follow. And, um, and we need a lot more of that. Um, one of the things when people ask me some of these questions 
And they tell me, well, how do you get more people to think, think like that? Do we need a, a, a reconciliation committee and all this? I'm like, nah, I mean, it doesn't have to be that hard. I'm like, do something you love with someone who's different than you. The simpleness of doing the thing you love with someone that's different from you means that you're probably gonna have some fun whether you end up liking each other or not. But in, in, invariably, because human beings are more alike than different, invariably you will start a conversation and then you'll get to trust each other and you'll ask questions. I remember, so Steve Kaysen was my first roommate at Virginia Tech, happened to be a white guy. We're the best of friends to this day. And I remember he asked me, you know, he's like, BK, you know, why do you put that grease in your hair? He said, I'm trying to wash the grease out of mine. If I don't, it's gonna look like dog hair. And we start laughing. And I was like, well, my hair gets dry. And if I don't put the, the, a little oil or something in it, it'll get brittle and break off. He's like, oh, well, mine gets oily. And if I don't wash it every day, it'll get really greasy and nasty. And so we started having these honest conversations and we'd laugh out loud about stuff. And, right. and so he stopped becoming a white guy and he was my roommate and we looked out for each other and I stopped being a black guy to him and I was his roommate and he looked out for me. And I think the simplicity of that interaction can become what more of us experience. I'm writing a book, well actually I just finished, um, finished the book a few days ago and um, it should get published in August um, uh, to commemorate the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And it's called The Tale of a T. And, and the co-author is a Jewish... T, T-E-A? T-E-E. -E. T -E -E. The Tale of the T, golf T. So a lot of people don't know that uh, it was an African-American guy, Dr. George Grant, who invented the golf T. And he also was the first professor, African-American professor at Harvard, and also was a, uh, a doctor. So talking about under, so people having to do so much you know, it, it's kind of par for the course for brothers. We got to do a lot of things <laughs> out there in the world, but that's okay. Um, and so the, the co-writer, uh, Jonathan uh, Blank, uh, we started emailing each other. He had saw where my wife, uh, Jackie Stone, had uh, helped to clean off a sign that was um, defaced uh, during some of the protests and the sign for, for Oliver Hill. And it, was, it ended up in the paper. So he wrote her and said, what a great thing she did. We were, we were on vacation in uh, South Carolina. And so then she said, oh, well, you should see BK's speech he gave at VCU and his movie that's out now, One Angry Black Man. And um, so he said, oh, my God, I love the speech. BK, I'm going to watch the movie. And we started this dialogue over the course of a few days. And the notes were so honest and so genuine that we actually captured them for a book. And so the book will be out in August. But it's, again, just the power of, of, of conversation between people who may be a little different. But what you find out, we both came to the same conclusion that the truth will set us free. Powerful statement. Um, and you're telling a story. And that's one of the most, I mean, life is a, life is a series of stories. And they're, they're, very, they're very impactful. And I remember one as a kid, growing up was on the show MASH, the TV show MASH. There was one uh, wounded GI who didn't want the wrong blood, right? I don't know if you remember that scene, remember that episode. And they joked with him and they, they, they um, painted his face and he, he said, did you give me the wrong blood? And they said, it's all the same. Oh, and by the way, the guy who, separate, who invented plasma to separate blood that saved your life is a, is a black doctor named Charles Drew. Right. And that was powerful because it made it personal, but it wasn't punishing, you know? 